everybody. I am Assembly Member Sharon Quirk Silva, and I'm happy to be here with you this morning. Finally, at least in Southern California, it's looking a little bit like a cooler day. So I know we all appreciate that. Uh, but we are here to talk about a uh, not just a but enormous issue in California related to housing, related to homelessness, uh, and what that may look like not only right now, but the future. We have a great group of speakers lined up, and I'm very excited not only that they've joined us today, but I really want to thank them right now to, uh, because as some of you know, this has become a very close topic, not only to me, but many individuals that have uh, really suffered through uh, not only the pandemic, but what their lives might look, might look like related to housing. And the, this group of people not only works at, as experts in the field, but this is what they do every day. And uh, I'm just so glad we have people like you uh, here with us. So with that, uh, Assemblymember David Chu will be joining us. Oh, I see that he has joined us. And uh, he is going to be kicking us off here, but he's the chair of the Assembly Housing and Community Development Committee, uh, and he represents the 17th uh, Assembly District. I know he also is a parent with, I believe, a five-year-old, so I'm sure he gets to have that wonderful experience all the parents out there are having, which is not only doing their jobs, but doing digital learning along with their children. And I'll just say, as a classroom teacher myself for 30 years, I have to give a huge shout out to parents and teachers and the students, because this is a new way to learn. And uh, my husband right now teaches junior high and he not only has started with online teaching, now they've moved to the hybrid model where the kids, some of them are in the classroom and some are on Zoom. That's a whole other uh, management uh, way. And they're junior high. So uh, I'm gonna give him a shout out, but I know it's, quite a job and I thank all of you out there for that. Um, with us today we have Amy Wilson uh, with the California Business Consumer Service and Housing Agency. She, they, uh, she will be speaking uh, and an acronym for that is BCSH. So if Amy can just raise her hand or say a hello, there she is. Hi Amy. Uh, we also have um, and a little bit about BCSH is they're a state agency whose mission is to assist and to educate consumers, and they also promote uh, funds that are safe and affordable and dignified for rental and home ownership opportunities uh, and partners with local communities to prevent and end homelessness. Thank you, Amy. Uh, in addition that to Amy, we have uh, Lee Farum or I'm sorry, Farron, and there she is. Hi, Lee, uh, with the Public Law Center, and Amy Goldman with the Community Legal Aid of SoCal. And again, such important uh, partners, not only now through the pandemic, but before, as we know, individuals that have to navigate the housing system on their own is extremely difficult. And because we have people like Lee and Amy out there, uh, that makes it a little bit easier. They'll talk about what they do. Thank you, Lee and Amy, for being with us. Uh, and as many of you know, housing is multifaceted issue, uh, and it is not just a, a single uh, type of housing or a single investment that is going to help us uh, move forward as a state uh, with housing. Not only our uh, young millennials who are entering the job force, but keep seniors in their housing. Also, uh, our most vulnerable families right now who have lost their jobs. This is going to take a lot of work, and I'm so glad we have you here to, today. I'm just going to jump in without making too many more remarks and let our esteemed housing chair uh, kind of start in, as I know he has to uh, move off to another Zoom. And I think Zoom is the right word for what we're doing. Uh, I don't, we're, many of you are too young to remember uh, this cartoon, uh, but the zooming in and zoom out, what was our cartoon named? Uh, the uh, family that lived in the future. 
I can't remember it. Uh, yeah. Jetsons. The, the Jetsons. Jetsons. And sometimes I feel a little bit like that as we jump from one Zoom to another, but it's certainly if there is a, a silver lining, it has allowed us to, to continue to con uh, meet, and I appreciate that. So without that, I'm going to ask Assembly Member and uh, Mr. Chair of our Housing Committee to begin his remarks. Um, hello, Assembly Member. Hello, Assembly Member. Hi, Sharon. How are you? Thank you for having me. And apologize, my background is usually not the one that I have, but um, I had some unexpected childish care issues this morning, so my son is occupying himself, so I've got to angle it this way, and all of you are parents uh, sort of know what that is about. And uh, yes, uh, I'm also uh, apologetic up front that I am Zooming from call to call. Uh, I use the analogy of the matrix. I feel like we are all matrix into, uh, into Zoom, and we're all just uh, feeding off this uh, this uh, this internet uh, internet beast, um, but uh, let me also just appreciate Sharon for for everything she's doing around housing, not just as a member of my committee, but I think it's fair to say, and I don't think any of our colleagues would dispute this, that um, Sharon, you've really become wow. a moral conscience in our legislature when it comes to housing issues and particularly homelessness issues, and I really appreciate. Um, you articulating just the importance and the need for this. And of course, my son is in the background. Buddy, could you please? Let's say hi to him, everybody. What, tell us his name again, because I forgot. I'm sorry. Lucas. Oh, you hi, Lucas. Um, and, and, and Lucas is known as uh, the child in the state assembly with the best, best hair. <laughs> the childhood hair we cut the least that's the yes it. It, yes yeah so uh i'm also, gonna but, hey, buddy. also i'm four years old now hey, buddy. okay so i'm seeing all these moms and even dads shaking their heads because this is our new norm and we just give such hugs and shout outs to all you parents yeah so uh so my family we're all living off the matrix and we're all living off of zoom so uh, with that, into housing. So I know, Sharon, you'd asked me to talk a little bit about tenant um, legislation we've, we've moved on. So I'll talk about that for a few minutes and then just touch on a few other areas that we- And if you can talk about where we left off as we kind of the session ran out on us, yep. but where we may pick up in January with some of the things that have transpired since we left. Yeah, so um, maybe global comment, uh, as Sharon well knows, and all of us in the legislature know, this was an incredibly difficult year, not just for the world, not just for California, pandemic, recession, uh, conversations around structural racism, wildfires, but, but also legislatively, um, we were forced off our legislative calendar for many months at a time uh, without the ability to do in-person meetings. Kind of politics as usual was very, very difficult and it was hard to hammer through uh, typical issues. Um, and my son is reminding me that COVID-19 was a factor. Um, so um, the, the big topic we did focus a lot of attention on was the plight of tenants. And just a little bit of background, in 2019, uh, we worked to hammer out an agreement before COVID on how to handle what had been skyrocketing rent prices around the state with AB 1482. Uh, and it was a bill that capped annual rent increases at CPI plus 5% and also ensured they were extending eviction protections against unfair eviction, so-called just cause protections. And we had all thought that that was going to address sort of the tenant plight. Uh, and, uh, and I also want to just take a moment and appreciate uh, Assemblywoman Kirk Silva for introducing AB 2895 this past year, which would have extended similar rent gouging protections to mobile home owners. And while that didn't get all the way through the legislature this year, I do hope we'll be able to move forward a similar effort next year. What we didn't expect was obviously the impact of COVID and the recession, which basically meant because we were telling folks to stay at home, they couldn't work their hours were substantially reduced, their incomes dropped, and a lot of folks weren't able to pay rent. Um, this obviously went on, this has been ongoing. And, uh, and fortunately for a period of time, the court system through the judicial council had put an eviction moratorium in place, but because of a variety of reasons, uh, they needed to lift that eviction moratorium 
at the beginning of September. So we were faced with the situation of needing to pass legislation to address the fact that we had potentially millions of renters who if they, if we had not passed a new law, would have immediately owed all back rent or be subjected to evictions. And the estimates for how many Californians we're talking about anywhere from three to 5 million were the typical estimates of what the potential tsunami of mass evictions could have resulted. So um, many of us, including uh, the wonderful hostess of today's event, we were all working around the clock to negotiate what became the agreement between the tenant and landlord community in resolving this. And that is embodied in AB 3088. And the thing to know about AB 3088, while it's complex, the most important piece is it protects tenants also, who are they able- they issue firefighters and police and ambulances. Sorry, guys. Um, uh, so, so what's important about this bill is it, it protects the subset of tenants who are able to document a COVID economic hardship from being evicted for missed rent payments uh, during this time period. And uh, what's important to know is tenants are still going to owe all rents they've missed. The law... Um, this law doesn't cancel or forgive rent. What it does is it converts missed rent during this COVID-19 emergency into consumer debt that is collectible in small claims court. And um, it involves effectively two time periods, March to the end of August, which is when we pass the legislation, and then the five month period from September to the end of January. For the first time period, which we refer to as sort of the most intense protected time during COVID, if you have missed rent, um, as long as a tenant signs a declaration under penalty of perjury that they've experienced an economic hardship, that rent cannot be the basis of an eviction lawsuit and can be collected through the small claims process uh, in early next year. When it comes to the transition period of September through the end of January, as long as a tenant also signs that declaration but is paying 25% of rent owed during those five months, they too cannot be evicted for not paying rent during that time period. So that's the gist of it. The five month time period is admittedly by all perspectives, a transition. It is temporary. Um, we know that there will very likely be another conversation in December, January, and this gets to some of what Sharon wants me to, to focus on, which is we're going to have to figure out in the next couple months what we're going to do after January the 31st. But part of the hope is we'll have a better sense of what's going on with the spectrum of the pandemic, with the recession, and um, buddy, I do need you to go back and play with your tricks. Um, with the recession, and um, and I will just say this: uh, hopefully, there may be a new presidential administration that may be more open to considering rental assistance and assistance to struggling landlords with federal stimulus dollars, and we'll have a better ability to assess, uh, obviously, in two weeks, but obviously, also, you know, come December, January, and whether that federal stimulus money might come down. So that's sort of the big picture of what's happening with tenants. Um, I'll also mention under this bill, AB 3088, we also extend additional protections to small landlords defined as those who own not more than three properties that contain fewer than four units or less. We extend what's known as the Homeowner Bill of Right protections, uh, which were protections that came about after the foreclosure crisis to make it, um, to create more transparency and accountability when it comes to that process. So we're making sure that, uh, that, that small property owners, if because rent is not being paid, they are suffering um, economically in a way that impacts their ability to make mortgage payments, they have additional rights through the homeowner bill of rights. So that's sort of the gist of AB 3088. I'll mention just two other topics and then happy to answer any questions before I have to dip off. Um, we had hoped this year that we were going to make much more headway on the topic of homelessness than we were able to do. Uh, folks may remember Gavin Newsom devoted his entire State of the State address to that topic. Uh, many of us uh, that we introduced in the Assembly side, half a dozen bills that got out of the Assembly over to the Senate. And unfortunately, literally half of those bills stalled in the Senate. The other half were vetoed by Governor Newsom. So my strong, yes, you can. 
my strong expectation is that we will have a very robust conversation around homelessness uh, coming up this year, uh, if, if Sharon or I have anything to do with it. And um, I would suggest that the main topics we will probably be covering are one, how do we ensure that every region in the state, city, county, you know, Orange County, et cetera, are planning and have a strategy on how to address homelessness. Not just a vision, but real plans with, uh, with real strategies and real tactics devoted to this. Um, secondly, we need to have a conversation despite the uh, tens of billions of dollars of budget deficits we're facing. We need to have a real conversation on money because clearly um, every part of the state doesn't have the resources to really adequately tackle homelessness. Um, but that relates to the third thing I'm going to say, which is we will also likely be having a conversation around accountability on the parts of jurisdictions to actually use the money smartly, efficiently, effectively, humanely to address it. And all of these issues are interlinked uh, because folks are not going to want to fund homelessness if there's not a plan, if there's not accountability. Um, counties are not going to be too excited about accountability if there's not funding. It's all sort of wrapped together. Um, I will also mention uh, that thanks to the work of Orange County providers with Judge David Carter, that work has provided a bit of a model for the state in what it means to get the disparate stakeholders together to really hammer out the tough solutions and how to address that. So that's going to be likely a very top agenda item this year. The last thing I'll just mention from a housing standpoint, just to round it off, we obviously have to have a conversation of how we build more housing uh, production. And it's fair to say that of the 14 or so production bills that got halfway through the process, assembly bills that got to the Senate, Senate bills that got to the assembly, of those 14 or so, only three got to the governor's desk. And we also were not successful at really moving forward things to figure out how do we speed up building housing at all levels of affordability. Shelters, navigation centers, supportive housing, uh, housing for families, housing for the workforce, market rate housing. So I expect that there'll be yet another push this year on that topic and, and, uh, and that will obviously be ongoing as counties and regions are doing their arena calculations and trying to figure out um, how to plan what they're going to build in the future. So that's around the world in 10 minutes. Um, let me know if you have any questions, but otherwise, uh, Sharon, Sharon knows all this and more. Uh, uh, just well, I, I don't. So if you could just take a few, but uh, let me ask uh, our, our communications. Joseph, do we have questions for Assembly Member Chu already in the queue? And then I'd also like to open it up to our panelists because Again, these interactions sometimes become the uh, place where ideas are formed for future legislation. Joseph? Uh, most, most definitely. Uh, we did receive a few. Uh, one coming from a Denise Spatchko. Uh, will the state legislator be making any more changes to AB 3088 before January 31st when rents become due? Uh, most people will not be able to pay due to delayed rent, especially those that are not working and have no unemployment insurance coming in. What will the state be passing, if any, legislation by the 31st to assist people to pay back rent? So it's a great question. It is literally a, I, I was going to say the multi-billion dollar question, but it's probably in the tens of billions of dollars. And um, just so folks are not you know, cut off guard, I think it is very likely that we will have to introduce a bill probably early in December to start the conversation of what could happen after January the 31st. I do not anticipate any changes before January 31st. And in order for us to pass legislation that would take an effect immediately, we'd have to pass it with the two thirds vote, which was the threshold that we achieved to pass the original bill. You know. I'll say that 3088 really was a compromise. Uh, it's fair to say tenant advocates, landlord advocates, no one was happy with it, but it has, it's getting us by. We, at least as of now, have not seen the massive wave of evictions that we would have seen if we had not put that in place. But unless the vaccine comes down and the recession goes away, I expect that the scenario that was just laid out of struggling folks who can't pay their rent is still going to be with us come January 31st. And what we're going to have to do is really fine tune who is going to continue to get protections balanced with what may be happening at the federal level. I will tell you, my strong, strong, profound hope is that the feds come to the rescue because unlike, um, unlike 
the federal government, state government, local governments, we can't print money. We have to balance our budgets. Uh, Sharon and I just voted for a, a budget that balanced a $54 billion budget deficit. And the idea that somehow we're gonna find pennies on the couch is just not gonna happen. If it were up to me, I would love to squeeze more money out of the budget to, to provide both struggling tenants and struggling landlords with relief. But I think it's pretty unlikely at the state level unless we find different revenue sources. So we have to wait for the feds. But all that being said, the quick answer is yes, I do expect we will be having a very robust conversation in December on January on this. Um, th the question also alluded to unemployment benefits and um, you know, Sharon and I have been working really, really hard to address what has been, frankly, a, an utter fiasco at EDD on this topic, which has compounded the plight of tenants and landlords. Um, so, so know that that's something we're, we're, we're focused on. Uh, wonderful. Uh, uh, we, thank you. Go ahead, uh, Joseph. We, we did receive another one. Uh, when talking about homelessness, uh, will there be a discussion of the homeless living with severe mental illness? And are any of the panelists familiar with the assisted outpatient treatment in California? So this will be open to all panelists involved. And why don't we let the panelists make those remarks as they're speaking, if they're gonna to speak to that and that way. Do you have anything to add to that question, Assembly Member? Yeah, so I'll, I'll mention two things. So I actually, uh, one, one of the bills I did get over the line this year, um, 